So good evening, uh, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, for this uh, Hortus uh, roundtable. Um, but the idea tonight really is to have a, a little bit of a, a conversation event. So rather than having a classic presentation, uh, we want to try to engage uh, with you, uh, the audience, and also with uh, some of the guests which we brought us uh, tonight with us tonight. Uh, I'm Marco, uh, director of Ecologic Studio. And here is Claudia, yeah. which is co-founder uh, of Ecologic Studio with me. And tonight we have a, a two moment uh, in this, uh, this roundtable. The first part will last more or less one hour and will be about uh, you know, describing the project, the Hortus project, how it came about and how we developed it. And uh, with me and Claudia, there will be also uh, Emmanuel and uh, Andrea and Mats and uh, Katrin Legrand will join uh, from, uh, from Skype because she is in Poland at the moment. Uh, when we start, uh, I think we, we will give you a little bit more detail of uh, who they are and what has been their role in the, in the, in the project. Um, then the second part will instead be a little bit more uh, kind of a broad conversation uh, with Alisa Andrzejk and Alexo uh, that will join us uh, in, a, in a little while. And this will really we will touch a uh, broader subject of computational design and urban ecology and we will try to discuss uh, the relevance possibly of, of uh, uh, these new approaches uh, in architecture and urban design and, and you know, hopefully engage with you in, in some uh, question and, and, and answer. So um, I start the now. The second part will be moderated by Lucy Bulliva. Precisely. <laughs> Sorry, Lucy. I was forgetting you. Um, okay, so um, I, I'll, I'll start now um, with the with the Hortus. Uh, this is uh, the quote that you see uh, up in the exhibition space, and um, I, I read it. It's from Gilles Clément, and it says, "If we look at the heart as a territory devoted to life, it would appear as an enclosed space, delimited by the boundaries of living systems uh, or the biosphere. In other words, it would appear as a garden. Uh, in fact, the etymology of the word garden comes from the German Garten." whose original meaning is enclosed or bounded space. In Latin, Hortus conclusus. So this obviously gives you a little bit of an idea of where we got the name Hortus, but also tries to uh, introduce this notion of garden that we will discuss during the evening, and in particular how we think of it in, in, a, in a broader sense, uh, which really looks at uh, uh, living systems and the biosphere as a whole, if you want, but also that connects uh, these notions with uh, the, the, uh, a, a sort of new way of looking at uh, a space itself. So uh, the idea of the, uh, the limitation of space that is no more uh, just uh, uh, the one uh, which is uh, provided by uh, physical boundaries like wall, but really like uh, uh, living systems have their own limits and obviously the biosphere uh, being the, the, bigger, uh, the bigger one. So uh, Ortus uh, is uh, also part of our research on uh, algae farming uh, applied to urban context that Ecologic Studio is bringing forward for, uh, since uh, five years um, and um, on the broader sense investigate systemic architecture. For us, uh, systemic architecture incorporates uh, uh, into the planning of contemporary cities the bottom-up mechanism found in nature as well as in the functioning of rural villages and post-industrial communities. <coughs> So basically, the, we decided to organize this presentation through uh, this uh, diagram, which obviously at this scale it will be hard to read, but eventually is really capturing the uh, multiple uh, feedback loops, uh, uh, which uh, uh, are actually uh, um, uh, fueling the, the, the system of the of Hortus upstairs. So there are different cycles that are um, uh, happening there, and, and some of them are related to the photosynthesis of the of the algae. Uh, some other has to do with the interaction between the public and the Hortus itself, and the digital uh, interfaces or the the Twitter uh, that will be uh, that is uh, also operating. So now we will use this diagram a little bit to structure the intervention also of uh, of our guests, and so to look at the different uh, implications of the project. And the first scale we want to look at is the actual large scale, probably uh, the one that is not so evident in the, in the, in the project upstairs that is uh, obviously contained in a room, but it is actually where the whole idea uh, is coming from. Uh, to do so, we will uh, briefly discuss a project we initiated in Sweden, which is uh, called the um, Simmersham Regional Algae Farm. And uh, that look at algae farm as uh, distributed on the territory and therefore different dimension of algae farm that engage with different social and environmental contexts. So, um, 
for this project, uh, we have uh, Mats uh, here, uh, which uh, actually joined us uh, from, from Sweden. And um, really, with him, uh, we, we uh, initiate the project. He, he has been, if you want, uh, the client for us. But uh, I think his role is a little bit more than the one of a classic client, because uh, effectively, he has been uh, almost like a curator in, in the relationship between the, the, the municipality of Simisham and, and ourselves. So I, I'll probably leave uh, uh, the microphone to Mats now, and, and, and he will give us a little bit of the background uh, to this project. Thank you. This was the first time I was called a curator. <laughs> Interesting. Um, well, uh, you know, I come from Sweden, but I, I've been working a lot of uh, also with uh, contemporary art, in, uh, um, but not as a curator, more like a producer and setting up meetings between uh, companies, science, scientists, and um, artists. Uh, but I see my role here as a, as a client engaging in ecological studio on behalf of the uh, municipal of Simlesham, and that is in the south of Sweden. Um, the municipality of Simlesham needs to formulate a new strategy for the future. I mean, uh, uh, it's been fishing and farming since the ice withdrew <laughs> about 10,000 years ago more or less, and um, now they have to come up with new ideas, and, and, and I met uh, Ecologist Studio through a friend of mine, Jonas Runberg, and he was, he's been a teacher here as well, so and I, I like to mention him. Yeah. I like to mention him because I think it's important with these social entrepreneurs. Um, <coughs> tourism is becoming more and more important for, for, for this region, and it's a very, very popular uh, some place to go in the summer. Um, and. Um, the, the uh, local politicians uh, came up with the idea to start what they call a new marine center because they are dependent on the Baltic Sea and the Baltic Sea, ha uh, it has a lot of problems. Um, um, so apart from municipal, I work with a project called Bioinspired Forum. Uh, on the aim here is to act as a catalyst uh, for knowledge transfer between material science, uh, architecture, design and art by initiating these kind of collaborations. Uh, and now soon I will work with the Modern Museum in Sweden uh, to connect um, them with two uh, material research centers in the Öresund region. And that it is also the southern part of Sweden. You can't see it on the map here. Uh, but it's just, um, well, Copenhagen is part of that as well. So it's a very uh, dense, pop densely pop populated area in Scandinavia. Uh, well, the two uh, material research centers are called European Spallation Source and MAX4, and uh, it's a huge investment, so something like 2 billion euro. So it will be a leading material research center in, in northern Europe. Um, <coughs> and then, apart from that, I'm trying to formulate some project together with some companies in Sweden. Uh, I mean, I've been talking to Absolute Vodka, and, and they are interested in these kind of ideas. So. Uh, I, I work a little bit like, like some kind of match, innovation matchmaker between the scientists and, and then, then the companies, and then I want to bring in uh, designers, architects, and, and, so, and artists in that process. <coughs> okay, so the Baltic Sea is the key for Simri uh, but how do we tap into this resource? Um, so for me, it's how do we go from scientific know-how or data to strategies for development? Um, the, the scientific community has accumulated a vast amount of knowledge and, and we have to find a variety of ways of, of uh, applying this in society or introduce it into society. Th this is uh, about to happen and I, I'm, I always end up with architects for some reason. <laughs> and I think you can have, have a key role to play here. Um, So I see the scientific data as a, as a kind of a raw material and through some kind of design process, uh, we transform it into some presence in space. And that's what these Hortus project or the regional um, algae farm represent for me. Um, <coughs> I, I sometimes say, say that you shape up science. Um, uh, so I, I think together we, we can unfold hid hidden values and structures. <coughs> So for me, the exhibition region al algae farm ha uh, has several layers of meaning. The first thing I think of is recontextualization. This is not something the, the local politician thinks about, but this things that I think about. Because in this case, we, we take an organism from, from the sea, 
and, and place it in a new context. And, and this renders the alley new meanings or, or, or potential interpretations. Uh, and sometimes, I, I th maybe we can see it as some kind of ready-made, I don't know. Um, and the backs or the photobioreactors becomes, for me, objects of fig fiction that triggers a story and in interaction with, with a visitor. <coughs> so the region Aliform uh, was part of uh, another a, a bigger project called Algae and Innovation Enzyme for Regional Development, question mark, um, uh, last year. And it had uh, some positive consequences. It was, we, we got a new influx of, uh, of ideas. Uh, we got access to knowledge-intensive networks. Um, we got new pro project proposals from external sources and also a platform for inter-municipal cooperation. Corpor corporations. Um, and regional and national authorities uh, are now ready to back up further development. And, um, and also the, the, the public perception of the area shifts from backward thinking to, to uh, visionary player. Um, and also the municipal land value increases. Um, <coughs> and, uh, and, and we also got new dishes on the table because we worked with some, some uh, famous chefs in Sweden in this proje project. So, in order to take this further, then I, I, I listed a couple of things we need to do. Uh, we, we need to attract a major player in, in this field uh, so that gives up some gravity when we develop this, this um, uh, area. Um, and I, and we, we need to get long-term backing from national and regional authorities. I think we need to invest in, in young. And, this, and also, if I compare it to the Internet, the Internet has democratized innovation. And I think the national science has to go a little bit the, the same, in the same direction. And that, this is a really important point for me. Um, so should I stay there? No, no. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mats. Um, I think that for us what was uh, really exciting of this was uh, one, one point I think you mentioned uh, when you came up with, um, with the idea that algae uh, could be uh, a medium to, to, to discuss uh, regional development. And obviously we have been doing, uh, for various reasons, experiments with, with biological systems before, but actually we never really thought about them in that scale and in that context, if you want. So. The project really started from, from, from that, to try to understand how we could use algae as a way of reading or mapping uh, the region uh, uh, of, uh, of um, Osterlin, and, and then uh, how we could begin to develop a uh, uh, different type of uh, architectural and urban uh, prototypes that could, in fact, uh, create uh, uh, the, the opportunities or the possibilities for, for uh, new developments to emerge. And this is a little bit what we, these slides are kind of illustrating. Yes, we, we will be mapping, in a way, the different uh, um, social contexts. Uh, on one side, uh, the, the existence of a series of farms, uh, on the other, the existence of, si of an infrastructure of the fishing industry that was no longer in use, as well as uh, the topographic region, um, the type of algae, and the opportunity that the different type of algae existing in the region can trigger. And then we started to create link between them and develop um, possibly uh, urban prototype uh, that um, will allow uh, new uh, formula of algae farming to emerge. In this mapping, we started to see algae as a material system, and um, here at the beginning of the presentation we have another of our guests, which is the biologist that has been working with us, and we'll discuss um, the different type of algae, how they can be effectively used more in detail. And then after that, we'll probably discuss more the Ortus project. Uh, and um yeah, I think one, one aspect that uh, Claudia was mentioning is that obviously when we started to analyze the landscape, and you know, on, on one side we, we, we tried to understand the, the, the sort of uh, um, let's say urban structure of this territory but on the other end we looked into more detail what kind of uh, uh, biodiversity of algae was present in the in the landscape already and and you know in order to do that obviously we had to to go more into detail understanding the different species etc cetera, etc cetera. so this is the catalog that we came up with at the end of the research but also to connect 
the opportunities that this uh, microorganism could generate, meaning the sort of industries that uh, make use of them, uh, uh, we needed more, more input. And I think that's the, the presentation that we are trying to, to, to have now uh, in directly from Poland, I believe, if we can get in touch with her. Uh, there, will be, there will be Katrin. As you can see here, there are we, we ended up uh, finding uh, seven uh, main uh, species, and each of them has a different potential of application. And the industry range from uh, research to tourism and to actual proper industrial productions. And we are talking about uh, energy, of course, but also uh, um, we are talking about um, uh, the cosmetic industry and the food industry. Uh, there is a lot of uh, development in that area, so particularly uh, in, in connection to, to the sort of uh, new emerging lifestyles that uh, we, we all know that has to be about uh, the kind of healthy product uh, industry, if you want. So these uh, these aspects of the projects is something that we we try to develop uh, with uh, with Catherine uh, as well and with her help. Um, are we able to connect to her or not? Because otherwise, I can go yeah, a little bit further. And then this was always going to be a little bit of a technical challenge, but. <laughs> I can I can go on a little bit while they try to to achieve uh, results there. Um, obviously, the the our main concern was to try and understand how could we articulate this uh, uh, relationship between algae farming and the growing of algae and uh, a landscape uh, like the one of Simisham. And um, obviously, there are industrial facilities now uh, that use uh, algae and that produce algae uh, for energy. Uh, function mainly, but there is not a, a there hasn't been a, a parallel exploration in trying to understand how uh, uh, algae can be uh, cultivated as such, how they can be uh, related to the spatial structure, the architectural systems of uh, of this uh, particular region. So that's where this uh, uh, sort of a new uh, prototype have uh, have emerged. But I think Catherine is there now, isn't she? Is it working? Hello. Hello. <laughs> I'm not sure I see you, but I hear you, so that's that's fine. Excellent. Hello. So we can hear you very well. So if you want to to start uh, yeah, from your presentation, I'm we are ready. I I'd like first to say that um, I am very grateful for the invitation because it's kind of uh, a bit surrealistic to sit in the snow here and talk about warm and green algae. Um, but uh, today I'd like to um, talk a little bit or present a little bit about this uh, small microalgae. And I guess you have had some of my colleagues from SAMS in Scotland that have been talking about this. Uh, Marco has been talking about that. But today, I don't know which, which slide you are showing because I don't see my slides, but Excellent. I guess it's the title. Yeah, it's the one that you sent us, so I can just follow you, if you know, like... Okay, so if, if you can go to the next, please. And um, on, on this slide, there, there are a lot of uh, different pictures and different shapes, and uh, microalgae basically are a diverse group of organisms, and they are made up of uh, various components, as you will see a bit later. And uh, originally, uh, the word algae has its roots in three languages, three uh, ancient languages. And uh, we have Greek, we have Hebrew, and Egyptian. And interestingly enough, in the three languages, uh, the word algae refer to something binding and red. Of course, in our mind, and as you have seen in the uh, the beautiful garden um, of algae, uh, algae are really red, I mean, <laughs> green most of the time. But their origin is red because when you do extract things from algae, basically you come up very often with a red powder, a red product. And in ancient time it was used in cosmetics, mostly. Um, next slide, please. When you look at this slide, well, just imagine that you have been uh, diving in one of the um, vessels that are exposed in the, in the exhibition. 
and uh, you would look at the sea surface from lying on the water and you would see all these tiny, tiny little bubble-like uh, shapes and those are microalgae and those are the ones I'm working most with. And, next slide please. And in the field of algae, uh, we basically have three main topics that are uh, coming up today and are very obvious. We have uh, a mix of scientists, engineers, uh, artists, architects, landscapists, landscape ecologists, and even human ecologists uh, working with the three fields. And of course, one of the most known or the most ancient is usually using algae to produce food or drugs. The second one is very focused on algal production systems, and this <coughs> refers to the energy that we can get from algae how to get large-scale production systems to produce biofuels, for instance, to produce algal oil that maybe will replace a little part of our uh, fossil oil that we are using today in our cars, in our industry, etc. And finally, the third one, which is rather a new field where uh, we, we do have Claudia and Marco and Andrea that are really right into it, a few other companies too, but I've decided to be biased today. And um, in this uh, field, uh, it is very new. And um, I think that having plenty of imagination and great ideas are a good way to start. Uh, then after the feasibility, well, that's another question. It's the next step. Next slide, please. When, when we go um, of what we can get from algae, we, we do have uh, good evidence and good production systems when it comes to extract chemicals from algae. And those chemicals, we know about them, but we don't think about them. They can be antibiotics, and they are uh, in foods, for instance, they are food additives. Uh, they can be neuroprotective products, which uh, forbid or prevent the degradation of our nerves. Uh, they could be uh, proteins that are used to cure people in nanotechnology, for instance. They can be all kinds of drugs, and the most common is probably nutraceuticals. And nutraceuticals mean food supplement, basically. So very often when you take vitamins or you take a, a little pill with uh, this compound, it's, it's coming from algae. So it's, it's really something that is very useful. Next slide, please. When we do look at an algae, uh, provided that we have produced a lot and uh, we just want to open these little green factories. And you have to think that algae are very complex because through evolution, they basically come from a cell which has it in another cell, which has it in another cell, which could have it in another cell. And on the uh, photo on the right panel of your screen, um, basically this is a, um, an architecture uh, exhibition as well to illustrate what our algal cell membrane looking like. And imagine that you have a mix of uh, bioplastic, basically. And this is extremely resistant because the different strengths of the different weights are actually applied to different places. And you do know that quite well in architecture as well. Um, for instance, in the picture, the, the lower picture, uh, maybe some of you will recognize which building it is. Uh, it's the Opera House in Chemnitz in, in the former East in Germany. And this building has been designed by um, Richard Möbius who was, of course, an architect, but he was also a mathematician, an astronomist, and he was very interested in lines and systems uh, of lines in space. And his building is one of the illustrations of this membrane structure, uh, giving the strength to the building, basically. Next slide, please. When we look at algae, they are made of different things. And some of them, this micro tiny algae, can be made of glass. Some others are made of chalk, like the cliffs of Dover, for instance. And 
A third category is basically very like sponge. They are made out of cellulose. So all those compounds, whatever it's glass sponge or, or chalk, are very resistant to extracting, to cracking. And this is something that uh, we are extremely interested in as scientists, basically. Growing and making um, decoration is fine. Having algae in our landscape is something extremely interesting. But what if we could find a way to fit this landscape to produce algae we would crack much easier. Next slide, please. So when we want to crack and extract cells, basically, uh, we do use different ways. We can use a mechanical way. We can use an expression way. Imagine the, the French press or the coffee maker. Uh, we can use ultrasounds. An ultrasound will shake the cell and basically disturb the molecular structure and open the cell. And finally, we can use electric waves to also disturb the molecule and crack the cell membrane. Next slide, please. So when we want to use algal products, the most common thing is to dry them. And imagine that you have left an apple uh, in your kitchen table for months, it will just shrink basically and this is what happens when you when you dry algae they will just shrink the water will just go away and then it's very easy to just crack by pressuring it or like with a mortar like instrument next slide please when you look at mechanical extraction uh, for instance with electric modulation which is um, getting very popular right now uh, since the patent was, was put up a few years ago. Well, as you can see from the series of photos uh, on the slide, you do have a very plump cell-like structure, and after the electric modulation, basically, uh, you just get an empty sac. The, the question is, do you get the substance that you are interested in from the cell? This is not yet. Um, seen at a very large scale. And finally, um, you can have the next slide, please. Uh, we can have extraction using chemicals, and this is what scientists or engineers or companies do when they extract drugs and, and uh, food supplement and uh, cosmetics, etc. Because this is a very expensive way, using chemicals, using different type of enzyme, using viruses. And because they're selling the products to an outrageous price, um, they can actually use a method of extraction which is expensive. But if we think in the future, or for the future, this is very unlikely that we would use this uh, biochemical extraction, such as plant extract or different type of enzymes, or even viruses like structure, um, because that wouldn't be um, economically uh, reasonable. And the problem is that it's often used with genetically modified organisms. And is this something that we would like for the future, especially if we integrate this in landscape, where, where are the risks? This is a very um, new field as well, and, and it is up for um, investigation. And next slide, please. Again, with the chemical extraction, I just wanted to illustrate um, in an architectural way, when you do use chemicals uh, that actually uh, will rupture the cells, what you do is stress the cells and the structure of the cells just uh, basically not implode but expand and ultimately rupture from the inside. And again, <coughs> expensive, toxic, do we want chemicals? No, maybe not. And finally, um, we we, we should go or aim for using green solvents. Green solvent is a word that is probably not existing in the dictionary at the moment, but it just means a solvent that would not be damaging to the environment and that would be very um, economically self-sufficient. But of course, it's for bioeconomists to look at this. So the field that Marco, Andrea, Claudia are in uh, is, is extremely interesting and 
I was a bit puzzled when I read the interview a few days ago on the Ortiz exhibition, and um, I don't have the words, but a famous London architect uh, said and was surprised that, uh, to realize that algae were hmm, creatures. They were not that artificial, they were kind of natural. And I, I was pleased to see that comment because very often when you look at the water, especially when you live in the city, do you think about what is uh, under the surface? Maybe not. So this, this is something for, for thought, some, some bread for thought. Next slide, please. And that should be the last one uh, on algal landscape development again. Um, the designs uh, that you see on this on this really beautiful <coughs> illustration from uh, Ecologic Studio is maybe not um, the most um, reasonable or efficient way to grow algae, but this is to be uh, developed, and I, I really think that uh, there is something to it. And, and in a 50 years, or definitely in a hundred years, our landscape would be filled with these structures. On top of that, they are very interesting for human ecologists. And one of the reasons is that green or blue or red are actually, and moving and water, are actually elements that uh, calm people. So with that, Thanks. I Thanks. Thank you. That you heard me quite reasonably. Yeah, it was perfect, actually. <laughs> so Thanks a lot for your intervention. Thanks, maybe do a little applause. Uh, so, um, yeah, I was hoping something would happen a little earlier than 100 years, because I'm not sure I'm gonna, <laughs> gonna still be there. <laughs> Excellent, thanks a lot. So we go back to, we sort of resume our, our presentation after this, uh, uh, sort of excursus in the world of uh, algal biology. I think it was really interesting to, to get a little bit more of uh, uh, sort of uh, hard knowledge, if you want, on, on what we were uh, playing with. Um, but again, obviously, our uh, sort of main concern in the project was to try to uh, uh, spatialize, if you want, or contextualize in a form of uh, architectural and, and, and urban plan uh, these uh, preoccupations. So these uh, uh, prototypes that you, uh, you see here are uh, our first attempt to, to do just that. So um, for instance, uh, two of them are the micro tower and the underwater museum. And you see in this uh, collage uh, what uh, we meant by doing that. Of course, these are just conceptual images, but we're really about trying to recognize the different uh, uh, sort of uh, environments that we found in the in the region and uh, try to understand how architecture could become uh, could mediate uh, between the different systems. So in this case, for instance, uh, uh, there are very popular bird watching areas. So we uh, we were imagining these uh, silos like algae farming towers, which could host. Uh, uh, both uh, bird watchers and also uh, algae themselves. There is uh, also the idea of beginning to create uh, some kind of symbiosis with the environment as well. And, uh, and you know, as we know, uh, uh, this is not about uh, uh, creating like the perfect idyllic uh, configuration. It's, it's more about uh, trying to understand how we can establish new relationship with an environment that is always anyway uh, kind of out of equilibrium uh, for different reasons, whether because it's, uh, it's a human intervention or because of uh, uh, environmental changes. Um, the underwater one, of course, was uh, trying to deal with the uh, uh, issues of uh, uh, coastal uh, development. Uh, there has been problems of overgrowth of algae there. Uh, often it is, is a consequence of agricultural uh, nutrients if uh, they end up in the water, but I'm sure you saw pictures also recently uh, in China as well and other places of massive uh, growth of algae. So I think it's something for us very interesting is about how not only you think about uh, growing or farming algae industrially, but how do you begin to be able to, to cultivate them uh, or in, in, in places where they overgrow uh, in, in the wild. Um, again, filtering gardens was another type of prototype related to the waterways, doing just that. And then farming network, crane greenhouses. Uh, the one on the top, for instance, was really dealing with uh, existing uh, uh, fishing infrastructure, which uh, hasn't been used uh, in the or I in the last years. Is uh, the fishing industry obviously has uh, been reduced? So there is an, an excess of infrastructure which uh, uh, could become, uh, in fact, uh, could be recycled and if you want. This one, in this we are trying to find the funding to to build up 
next summer the one that is used in the fishing infrastructure. So to change scale in comparison yeah. to the prototype you've been developing until now. So the structural system of the prototype you see upstairs is, is in fact about uh, this uh, hanging, uh, hanging model and uh, hanging logic. So um, going to, to our to, uh, for us uh, is the beginning of one of our prototype and uh, is a space of cultivation. For our cultivation, as Marco underlined also before, is, is a key point. Um, because it creates a, a relationship uh, with the user. Um, in fact, in, in the existing algae farm, which are effectively factory, there is almost no relationship with the user. Uh, what happens is that algae farm uh, cultivate algae very intensively, apparently very efficiently, um, but then what the user receive is uh, simply a energy that they don't know where come from. Yeah, I think that mm. they sort of, just yeah. if I can add one, one thing, the, the idea of cultivation really is uh, somehow a little bit beyond the, the, the sort of metaphoric meaning. It, it's really trying to understand the fact that uh, uh, there is a possibility to, to, to if you want, borrow uh, uh, the, the kind of, uh, the way a, a gardener, if you want, uh, uh, has to deal with living processes continuously to be able to create or extract beauty from, uh, from, uh, from a garden. And uh, to a certain extent, I think the same uh, uh, way of operating can be imagined in, in, in the production of architectural spaces. And that's a little bit what, what we are trying to do upstairs. As well. So we try to borrow some of the material system of uh, algae farming and uh, like the oozes, the pumping of CO2, but in this case, the CO2, rather than coming from the environment, environment of our pro also from a positive burn is effectively coming from the user which is forced to is invited to to blow and uh, somehow forced to look at the algae as well and at the oxygen that gets liberated and uh, while people interact the more they interact the more the garden in a way will evolve because the more photosynthesis happen the more algae grow so the, the first uh, gradient that the ga garden have will eventually evolve in town time by communicating with the user so, I mean and uh, yeah. there is a second level of, <laughs> can you say, I was going to say okay, this first, okay. okay. And uh, there is a second level of, of communication or control that are somehow interwoven in, in this project because we are somehow on one sense, uh, we could say that we are monitoring the algae because we have a seri series of sensors embedded. <laughs> on the other sense, uh, side, we could say, that we are f um, enabling uh, uh, more communication with the user because there are sense of the register, the amount of photosynthesis that happen, and if there is not enough, there, there are these red light that um, blink and ask for interaction. There are, there were in previous installation. We have been then evolving this uh, in a different system in the current installation that we have above. So these were the light blinking, the LED light. Uh, these were present in another system, or probably more similar to the one we have above. But this will involve in quite a lot of cabling and, and the infrastructure. So in this case, we decided to test uh, for the first time uh, uh, a different method. And we use QR code, that which are currently used uh, on many products, uh, mainly to access the URL or the website of the product and read about it. No? So rather than using the that we are using them to access a URL, but somehow for us they become sensor because each cluster of algae have a different QR code. So through the, the, um, the different QR code, we can locate the person when interacts with the bag and scan the QR code, and know as well the amount of interaction that happened. And the person as well could access a URL where has got some of the information about the algae that are not just about uh, we have been interacting enough or not, but there are also more about what you can do, how it looks like at the microscope and etc. No? Yeah, so basically we created a, a, a layer of, of graphic, if you want, in this case, much more immaterial, uh, but that exploits, if you want, the fact that most of us are now equipped with, uh, with uh, smartphones or with pieces of technologies which basically enable us to read this graphic and to access uh, a, a another dimension of, of the garden, which in this case is the virtual interface which we built for, uh, for Ortu. So uh, this is basically what you see when you, when you actually scan the, the, the QR code, so you actually have a sort of lens inside of the bag, almost like a, a virtual lens which tells you uh, the sort of information we, we heard before 
before uh, about uh, each algae. But at the same time, uh, uh, you, you get a, a, a Twitter button, which uh, again, uh, sort of opens up a different dimension in the garden itself. And this is obviously what we have been uh, exploring for with this installation. I think it's something we haven't done before, but it was really trying to expand this notion of cultivation and really bring it uh, into the, the, the dimension of a social space and social networking. And, and, and that's what we, we, we sort of- uh, You could follow your, your alga to a certain extent through the graphic of the virtual garden when you are in the space, but also where when you're not there, basically. Yeah, so uh, wh what we've done with the help of Emmanuel, which is gonna talk in a second, it's, it's really trying to have a, a, a digital interface which would uh, uh, sort of map or match the physical one. So you would actually uh, access another dimension of the project, which uh, is related physically with, uh, with, uh, with the actual space, but uh, obviously hasn't got the, the physical boundaries which limits it. So it can host uh, uh, a lot more uh, people, a lot more individuals, and a lot more uh, exchanges uh, than, than the, real, the real garden can at any moment in time. Um, I'll bring in Manuel right now, so he will give you, you know, just a little bit more of an insight in these kind of experiments. Of course, we had to, to write uh, a whole set of codes that were able to, in fact, uh, uh, take the, the, the Twitter messages and turn them into, into this digital map. And, and you know, Emmanuel was, uh, was obviously uh, helping us on that. And I, 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 leave, it, I leave him to, to introduce. Of course, Emmanuel, many of you may know him. He, he's a, a DRL graduate and uh, media study tutor, he works uh, at Forza and obviously works independently in a, as a computational uh, designer. Um. Right, uh, first I want to thank uh, Claudia and Marco for inviting me and also to, uh, uh, to be able to collaborate with them on this very interesting project. So uh, what I'm going to talk about in this presentation is our first talk about the, the process behind you know the visualization and then the details of you know what the visualization is about um, in fact when Marco first uh, approached me uh, about this project uh, th the time of development is pretty short actually like two weeks of actual writing the code and pr you know pretty much late nights since I have to work in the office so uh, so uh, along the way, there are a lot of uh, decisions made based on that duration of time allocated for uh, the development of the visualization. So one of the main thing, of course, is getting data in, in this case, the, the tweets, and as well as the number of visitors that come to the physical exhibition, as well as the virtual website. And as well, and then how to get that data out in a rather meaningful way that relates to the general concept of uh, how to. S so, this is the data you know that you get, and you have to kind of press through it, find ways of understanding it, and and kind of get it out visually in a in a meaningful way. So, I mean, this is just a, an extract of the XML file that you get from the search uh, in Twitter. So um, though this is not my preferred uh, flow of data for, you know, for the project, but because of the duration of time, uh, this is being opt as the, the quicker way, probably the quickest way to develop this uh, interface. So first on the, the tweets comes in um, from the Twitter server itself. And then the number of visitors that comes in, whether <coughs> they visit, I mean, quantitatively, uh, the visits they go whenever they scan a QR code, they will be ended up in that specific species uh, of the LJ page. So that will be counted. So these are actually the main mechanism to, to kind of uh, get quantitative and qualitative data. And then it goes through the, uh, because the, the visualization uh, applet is, um, lives within the, the website in the AA server. So um, in this case, in the diagram, it's kind of clear. And then it goes out through two main outputs, uh, desktop browser and mobile browser, which is, uh, I mean, surprisingly, well, for, for <coughs> people who don't develop apps or, you know, do such visualization, it's pretty different. So I'll explain uh, what are the difference. So first thing, 
um, when he told me about this project, you know, he wanted to do something that relates to the physical space. First thing I did is to decide which platform, which programming language, because different platform and pro different programming language has different uh, <coughs> strengths and weaknesses. So first thing, they told me, okay, we're gonna have this exhibition and it's gonna be f shown in uh, the applet. Not Android, but uh, iOS, so therefore, in this in this uh, slide, it means therefore Objective C, therefore C plus plus, therefore Xcode. So, which is different. On the other hand, which is uh, the the software that I use more often, uh, in this case Java processing, uh, which is, you know, there is a more like a direct path towards Android. So, first thing first, am I going to do both at the same time within two weeks? or I'm going to choose one of them and see any compromise in between them. So on the, on the web-based applet side is that uh, the original idea is to write a processing script, which is an open source uh, software, and then uh, place it uh, within a, a more like a JavaScript framework so that it could load, which is ideal because uh, ideally uh, one would not want to load an applet. I mean, I'm talking rather technical right now, but you know it's just clear for those who are interested. You know. <coughs> so, and then next thing is okay, uh, the the tablet, the iPads in the exhibition, um, they are specific. Uh, uh, you know, is is Apple on the other side is the Android. So one of the experiment that was tested. During the process, a very quick process is doing the phone gap, which is a cross-platform thing, so that in any case, if they do use the uh, iPad or whatever, it can you know work fine, just fine through a web-based JavaScript-based um, um, scripting. So this is the one of the first prototype that I wrote in Xcode in C++, whereby uh, is tested on a simulator and then seeing how it works. Generally, the design that uh, we kind of talk about is that they had this idea of the roof, which undulates and somehow changes form based on certain data that comes in. And then, originally, there was like a grid of, you know, uh, of, of uh, rectangles that, that kind of uh, shows the, uh, the visitor's position. So we're kind of brainstorming, talking about even like geolocation is totally difficult because it's so close to each other and then we even talk about augmented reality and all that kind of stuff but it's kind of you know kind of streamed down along the way by a lot so uh, some so the other thing that first um, write one for the the iPad and then test it out since iPad and iPhone is the same same code more or less and then quickly test it out test the speed if it's realistic to load the 3d geometry how to simplify it so that it's lightweight enough so go f don't go for meshes, go for lines and points, and, and how to kind of retrieve the data. In this case, this you know, really quick test is to see um, how the natively the, the phone could extract data on its own without going through the AA server or, or whatever. Uh, and it does suggest something. For example, the one on the left, quickly loads, you know, 15 latest tweaks, and then it just jammed the whole 3D visualization, which is not ideal. And then some of the test was done whereby you load the latest, you know, the last tweets, and, you know, et cetera. And then the idea of the size, how it, it affects the interface differently. And then next thing is eventually, you know, decided on, okay, let's, let's write a processing one. Uh, stripped it of its all the possible libraries in case there's any issues when you know people go to the go to the website they can't load it because there's some uh, you know problem with the Java applet. So uh, in this case, the code is totally written with no external libraries, well, not even the the WebGL. So um, it's so just some screenshot shots of the uh, the code. And now I kind of explain the 3D visualization um, part by part. So if, if I had gone to the website, the first thing you saw is this. And then it loads for a while, and then it's, it moves around, so, and it contains the latest 15 tweets. And then you can choose to, to refresh it. And so in, 
in the screen, you would see uh, when you actually first load the data. And then it will show you when you want to update it. You know, in, in the case of exhibition, you, you tap it. In the case of the web browser, you just kind of click once anywhere in the, in, in the applet. And then it loads. The, this is very critical, like what I said, because of the time lag. So therefore, the idea of refresh only necessarily by the user. Um, so some of the ideas to make it meaningful, uh, but not in the overtly representational way, is to, uh, for example, what I learned from uh, Marco and Claudia is that the LJ actually have different coloration, uh, which is a means of kind of identifying them. So that's one, you know, one interesting data that you know could be used as a dynamic parameter. And the other thing is the floor plan of the exhibition, because if the floor plan is actually makes of kind of a Voronoi uh, distribution, but the idea is to to you know to have this kind of free flow space at the bottom of this undulating roof. So therefore, uh, in the code within it, there is a intelligence whereby they make sure they are within you know the Voronoi shape allocated, representing each cluster of the LJ. And then, wait, uh, and then the the second part, which is so first, is the horizontal you know differentiation visually of the roof structure of the roof coloration as well as the the, the ground, which is basically the position of points. And then next is the the undulating roof. So what actually happens is that um, because the count is going to increase all the time, how can we make a um, a roof that don't just keep, you know, becoming bigger and higher and, you know, distort in a non-legible way. So the idea is to have a relative uh, understanding of which is the most popular LG, meaning who visited most, who did a scan code most. That guy will get the most, uh, you know, highest height undulation. And so at any point in time, the other cluster get become more popular, the whole thing remaps again. Right, and then very quickly, this actually basically last two slides. So a uh, few other things is that how to kind of also indicate, you know, some kind of numbers so that people looking at vis visualization do understand that how many actual visitors uh, went to the virtual and the physical exhibition. Yeah, so this is pretty much the, the explanation. Thanks. Sorry for speeding you up a bit, but uh, we, we also want to, to we, I think we're running a little bit late, so we don't want to go too, too late. Um, but hopefully this uh, has given you a little bit of an insight also on the kind of technical aspects of, of making the interface and, and, and making it work in the limited amount of time we had. Um, so we, we just go quickly on the last part of the presentation, which uh, sort of explains the, the, the sort of uh, 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 morphological aspects of, of, uh, of the space, which are pretty much related to the opportunities uh, uh, that uh, we, we needed to exploit. Algae needs to, to photosynthesize, so to grow, and so that means uh, controlling or being able to simulate and design uh, uh, both the uh, natural light that comes in and the artificial wide spectrum light. So quickly, these are some of the simulation that were necessary and it also became for us a design tool, it became a way of articulating the density of the algae and somehow uh, uh, create creating a kind of differentiation. Creating a first, uh, a first garden, this is the picture on of another one we did, uh, probably the first one in 2006 that was um, as well responding in this case to solar radiation. And this is, uh, is, a, is a, a digital model we built with Grasshopper and, and that is mainly related to uh, uh, the uh, possibility to simulate the relative position of uh, um, uh, artificial light and, and, and uh, the actual um, um, bioreactors, the position of the bags. Uh, this uh, is also uh, a model that we, we initiated in a previous version of the project uh, that was part of the Seville Biennale in 2008 and that has been uh, kind of evolved uh, for, this, uh, for this particular installation. Um, I leave Andrea, uh, which uh, is a part of Ecologic Studio uh, since two years now and uh, he is uh, the, uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, algorithmic designers that has helped uh, developing and refining this 
this model and uh, I, he will just illustrate uh, uh, quickly the, the last uh, part of uh, the presentation and then we have a little break. Mm -hmm. There are still Thanks. bacteria. So the algorithmic design of the installation followed a series of different steps. At the beginning we had to negotiate the different input that we got from the room. So we created a series of s a system of catenaries that could wrap around the chandelier and could expand in front of the windows in order to get more light for the different bioreactor. And after this step, we introduced a series of attractor to create do do two different surfaces, one hosting the, bio the algal bioreactors and the other one hosting the stem that uh, should have contained the, bacte the bioluminescent bacteria. And the idea of creating a morphologies of these surfaces using a series of attractors was to allow the people to uh, experience the environment in a, in a different way because uh, we were able to create a diversified environment where people can play with the system, can interact with the system and could feed the system in a series of different ways. As you can see from this image, the you can see how the surface and the different gradient of color using different intensities of algae came out in the, in the final installation. So the third step of the algorithmic process was the, res the definition of the resolution of the two-dimensional grid that affected the step and the distances between uh, the bag. And this was defined using, uh, as an input, the, the path and uh, the space needed by the, the visitors to interact with the, different, uh, with the different bag. And in this part of the process, we also defined the different gradient of color and the different intensities that we of algae that we put inside each bioreactor. And together with this information, we also define the different amount of nutrients that we put in each bag in order to create uh, a series of uh, overlapping system of intensities that could lead the system of the gardening in its evolution throughout the months, the month of the exhibition. As you can see, this is a sort of grid where we define the different, the amount of water, the amount of algae, and the amount of nutrient for the bioreactor. And this is the last step in the design where we, you can see the combinatorial effect of the hanging garden and of the floor system where we introduce the series of uh, uh, seating made with uh, rolled carpet and a series of uh, iPad station. These two systems overlapping together creates a series of uh, basically infinite mode of uh, experiencing the space of, uh, of the Ortus. Yeah. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks. I just wanted to add one, one thing to this is that the, um, there is uh, something interesting in, in the possibility to uh, prime the system, so to introduce a differentiation while at the same time allowing for uh, the evolution of it uh, in during the time. So uh, rather than starting with a completely homogeneous space, we uh, already read the, the differences in the room and we, we created a, a space uh, which uh, accordingly to that uh, you know, is articulated in a surface and in different gradients of colors and nutrients, etc. No? Then from there, uh, the, the, the organization uh, remains open. No? There is a certain uh, uh, level of under-specificity in the way the program <coughs> can unfold. So each one of you can in fact enter the room and sort of uh, use it uh, in a different way, which is a lot what is happening if you if you go up uh, in, in these days. Um, there is a um, small extra component to the installation. Um, as you can see there, as uh, also we discussed before, the, the algae produce a bubble of oxygen. And uh, this bubble can be used in different way and uh, can be just become gradient in the room as what is happening now or can feed other microorganisms, some of which are uh, uh, bacteria. Uh, we've been developing some work in the last month, uh, but we didn't manage to integrate it yet in this uh, installation. Um, that was about uh, uh, growing in symbiotic relationship with uh, some of the algae, in particular the second surface Andrea was talking about, the one that has got this 
the vacuum form container, which we call Bricole, um, referring to the light in the Venice Lagoon, but this is another story. And um, <laughs> to integrate some of these bacteria and cultivate them so that they could produce light. At the beginning, we uh, introduced them a bit randomly inside of the container, uh, uh, running a series of tests, and then we started to design uh, their interaction with, uh, with the algae. So the idea is that the algae will float on the bottom and there will be bacteria inoculated with a certain pattern that will become sort of small organic LED, if, we, if you like. Uh, but at the end, uh, the, bi the, the biologists came on Thursday before the opening to inoculate them, but then realized okay, that the effective exhibition space was very near to a bar and effectively a public space, which we thought was interesting for us because somehow the exhibition was not an exhibition but became a sort of public space. But then he was very scared about it, so I guess we will test it <laughs> in another occasion. I think we should close it here for this first part, otherwise we will run really completely late. Um, I think we're probably taking a break of maybe five, ten minutes. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. yeah. And and then ten. Okay. Nick is suggesting ten for technical reasons, and then uh, we look forward to have you here again to start the second round and this uh, conversation with Elisa, Lucy, and Alex. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>